All right. Thanks so much, everyone. We're going to move on to our next speaker today. So next up, we have Gualtiero Yeager. He recently completed a PhD in physical oceanography in the MIT Hui Joint Program, where he studied the ocean's response to and the influence on monsoon rainfall in the Bay of Bengal. He previously worked for an acclaimed photographer in Sao Paulo before studying physics at UCSB. Please welcome Gualtiero. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll jump right in and I'll start with a little story. I'll take you back to 2015. That year, starting in April and lasting through summer into October, there was an unprecedented historic red tide off the coast of California. This is a harmful algal bloom. Uh, these tiny creatures produce a neurotoxin and it seeps into the food web so that by the end of that fall in October, November, the Dungeness crab and the rock crab fisheries were affected. The levels of toxicity of the crabs were public health risk. Fisheries were shut. Entire you know, fishing industries could not operate. Initial estimates of revenue losses were around $50 million. So a large scale disaster of unprecedented scale. That same year, um, in October, we had another disaster on the east coast so actually going back to south carolina where we just saw a previous presentation that year um atmospheric winds and a hurricane offshore conspired to lead to again an unprecedented unprecedented historic rainfall event over the carolinas there were widespread rainfall of 15 to 20 inches it led to devastating floods homes were destroyed Fields were flooded, and this was right at the beginning of the, the harvest time for sweet potatoes, for peanuts, for cotton, large effects of industry. So these two disasters were of large scale and of such magnitude that the federal government stepped in to support the regions. However, there's a big disparity in that response. The, the farmer whose crop was devastated, if he had crop insurance, about 30 days later, he received his paycheck to make him good. The homeowner had to wait a little bit longer. If they had flood insurance supported by FEMA, they had to wait about three months for a check to arrive. A fisherman who couldn't fish that season had to wait for three years, over three years. So the disaster occurred in October, November, 2015. The federal aid finally arrived in May, 2019. Not entirely efficient or effective. So that leads us to today's presentation, which is a study on fishery disaster insurance. Uh, this is part of my Canals Fellowship work, and before I get started on this, I'd just like to thank Sea Grant for offering the opportunity of a Canals Fellowship. I'd like to thank my host office, especially my supervisor, Stu Levenbach, and everybody I know who I've interacted with and has had great input into this work. It's a work in progress, and I've appreciated everybody's feedback and critique. Um, it's benefited a lot from talking to people at conferences, at regional fishery councils, and I'd love to get your feedback and thoughts on this too. So what is a federal fishery disaster? I've mentioned the red tide event off California. That's one example. Um, another example would be a large scale salmon run failure that could be due to a disease decimating a salmon population or habitat degradation and other environmental effects leading to a collapse in the recruitment. It could also be a, a hurricane that actually devastates infrastructure, fishing fleets and gears for a large region, leading to complete loss of you know, the ability to fish. So these are the types of disasters that the federal government gets involved in. Now, the, the crab example that I showed you with the red tide was not an anomaly. What I'm showing you here is over the past decade and a half, all the disasters where NOAA got involved and how long it took from when the local government requested assistance to when the federal money was actually granted. And so the length of this bar shows you the length in years. And so you can see that over the past decade about almost all disasters took over two years for federal assistance to arrive. Now two years is really a long time if you have a complete loss of revenue for a year. But some of these disasters had to wait for five, six years, actually, for assistance to arrive. What causes this long delay? It's part of how the process works. So on the slides, you can see a lot of meatballs. There's a lot of agencies and branches of government involved. Um, if a disaster occurs in some region, 
a local government to be a tribal government or a state representative or a governor can request assistance. NOAA has to make an analysis and see if this is a reasonable request. The Department uh, of Commerce Secretary has to approve it. If it's approved, Congress has to actually appropriate money. That can sometimes happen very quickly. Sometimes, depending on when in the budget cycle it happens, it can take a long time. Depends also on political pressure. Once money is appropriated, if it is, um, an allocation has to happen, determining where the money that's appropriate goes to. Spend plans have to be developed. Those have to be developed by local governments, collaborating with NOAA, they have to be approved by DOC again. The Office of Management, Budget, Management and Budget has to be involved. Finally, they have to be approved again by Congress before they go out as a grant. And mind you, that's not even the time when the actual local fishermen might get support, because then it takes time to actually disperse checks. So could we potentially fast track this and replace this process to an extent with an insurance scheme? something that is fast and it provides direct aid to fishermen affected by disaster. And so that's the question of this study. How could this be done, if it's feasible or not? To kind of set the stage, well, does something like this exist already? The answer is no. Uh, this large circle for fisheries is empty. There are insurance products on the market for somewhat similar fields or industries. If you go to agriculture, of course, the federal government is heavily involved with the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. Um, that is a subsidized program. It is handled by private insurance brokers, and it covers about 80% of the acres planted in the U.S. Um, if you look at aquaculture, which in some ways kind of in between agriculture and fisheries, there are some aquaculture insurance policies offered by the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation again. They're few though. Um, there are some private insurance companies that offer coverage. They're usually the very bespoke and tailored solutions. They're, the industry is better developed in Europe. And in general, there's, you know, there's not a huge market. There's not a lot of options out there. Lastly, if you look at catastrophe insurance, so insurance for things like hurricanes or severe weather, again, the federal government is involved through FEMA, through the National Flood Insurance Program. There's also private reinsurance um, solutions out there. And so I'm gonna take a look at kind of all these different uh, markets out there and see, could we tailor something or could we incentivize something? Could we produce some solution for fisheries? Um, as I set out, the policy goals that were, you know, that I developed and that were given to me by my office are the following. Timely relief, reaching the people in greatest need um, in a way that involves responsible risk sharing, supporting long-term goals. So I think these four points are key. The relief has to be timely to be really effective. Uh, only if it's timely does it actually reach the people in greatest need. If it reaches fishery community three years later, it could very well be that some fishermen, some small businesses have already gone out of business by then. Um, and there's, I think, uh, a valid idea to involve some sort of risk sharing that, of course, in a, you know, a large scale federal disaster, the rest of the country comes together and supports that region, but there also has to be some form of risk sharing involved. And lastly, of course, any potential uh, product or solution has to be integrated with long-term fishery management goals. <laughs> Who do we talk about when I talk about fisheries and communities? These are the stakeholders that we wanna support. There's the primary people actually involved in fishing. Commercial fishermen, tribal fishermen, charter fishing, and recreational fishing. So we saw a little bit about charter and recreational fishing earlier in the presentation uh, from Stacy. Those communities, those stakeholders are of course supported by a whole you know, supply chain and closely linked businesses and communities, be that gear suppliers, be that ice plants, for example, for commercial fisheries, uh, processing plants for commercial catch, and lastly, just the marine sector heavily depends on the fishing revenue. So these are stakeholders that we want to keep in mind as we see we can create some type of insurance product. We also have to look at what type of disasters hurt these stakeholders and if we can address them. So this lot on this slide, um, what this is, is a map showing you the major categories of federal disaster appropriations since 1990 and have put them in some major categories. So if you look at the largest bubbles, the, the salmon colored ones on the Pacific, in the Pacific, 
those are a major source of disasters, both along the West Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as in Alaska. The other second largest category, if you go back to the Atlantic, are hurricane disasters. Those affect mostly the Gulf of Mexico and the southern Atlantic coast, as well as the Caribbean. Um, disasters also occur due to stock collapse. That could be due to various effects. It could be different. You know, there's crab stock collapse. There's Pacific sardine collapse, stock collapse, as we've seen. There's um, the influence of harmful algal blooms, as the opening story illustrated. And lastly, in the Gulf of Mexico, we've seen repeated flooding events that harm fisheries, as well as oil spills. There are some, you know, kind of random um, disasters, but these are major categories co covering them. So if we look at all these appropriations, it's about 1.5 billion since 1990, um, and that's about 60 million per year. So it might seem like a large number. To put it in perspective, though, annual revenue from fisheries, um, this is only 1% of annual revenue. And if you look at the whole value added by US fisheries, this is only a tenth of a percentage point. So lots of disasters can affect fisheries. In general, you can think of that in two categories. Either there's no fish or there's no access to get the fish. If you look at where that money actually goes towards, those on average 60 million per year, 60% of that goes to direct payments. So a large portion of the federal money that's appropriated for disasters is delivered to fishermen as a check. Smaller categories go towards habitat restoration, towards infrastructure repairs, and a smaller portion in that goes towards research and management. The category that we're really trying to, to target and make more expedient is the direct payments. Because the direct payments are most effective if they reach the the people involved as soon as possible. So over the next couple of slides, I'll first give you a brief, you know, kind of basic introduction of how does insurance work, what are those necessary components we have to look at, and what are some options. So fundamental of insurance from the customer's perspective, they eliminate the possibility of a large loss and take on a steady small premium instead. I mean, we all know how health insurance works, how car insurance works. From the company's perspective or the provider's perspective, the collection of all these small premiums minus the cost of risk and the cost of operations for them should equal a profit margin. Otherwise, there's no profit margin and no market. So what determines if insurance is viable and affordable is really what is the cost of the risk and operations. If that is high, then premiums have to go up as well, or there's simply no profit margin left and the federal government subsidizes it. What determines what this cost of the risk and cost of operations are, um, are the following three factors. And this is a busy slide, but there's three, the nature of the hazard, the nature of the customer, and the nature of the claims really depend how affordable it is. The, the, green, bar, the green row shows you the types of you know, hazards that are affordable to insure. If it's isolated and familiar type of danger, like car crashes, we have a pretty good data set knowing how frequently car crashes occur. They occur randomly, so there's not like a whole region all at once has a car crash, then it's affordable. Um, if the hazard is regional in scale and there's less data on it, like a flood, it's much more expensive to pr produce an insurance product for it. Because a flood can hit an entire region uh, an insurance provider might be hit by a billion dollar claim and there's less data to actually predict that especially if there's changing statistics the type of customer depends uh, affects it so if there's many customers and they all have pretty similar risk profiles you can spread the risk broadly and thinly so the cost to each customer is low however if customers are few and idiosyncratic and all different it's much more expensive to to operate the insurance and lastly, the type of claims. If it's easy to verify the claim is correct, then there's less potential for mis you know, misrepresentation, fraud. If the claims are hard to verify and hard to determine what they were caused by, it's much more expensive to operate an insurance scheme. And so down in, in circled in red here are kind of three dangers that insurance companies and insurance providers are faced by. They have uncertainty in modeling the risks. If there's more uncertainty, they have to charge more. There's 
the risk of adverse selection. That is, if you offer an insurance product, only the riskiest participants buy it, and that skews how much costs you take on. And lastly, there's always the danger of moral hazard, that people change their behavior and become riskier participants if they know they're insured, or outright fraud. And so, how does fisheries stack up? Well, you can probably guess it. The bottom row, fisheries are affected by regional disasters. There's less information about these. Fishermen are relatively few and idiosyncratic, and it's hard to verify claims. So, unlike car insurance or crop insurance or even aquaculture insurance, it's really a trifecta of difficulty in operating such a insurance scheme. And so as we, over the next couple of slides, think about what potentially options exist, we really want to see how can we address these three different dangers and produce something that circumvents these. And so what I'll go over are the three, well, today I'll go over the two basic components out of three of an insurance scheme. The first question is, what is actually covered? What is the coverage? Second question is, how do you run this scheme? How does the insurance scheme work? And lastly, where does the money come from? And what I'll go into next is the coverage. Two questions is, what is the type of risk? What is the payout? The first question, we know by policy. We want to insure disasters. We don't want to insure shallow losses. So we don't want to provide a product and get into the business of you know, providing a smoothing of income to make sure that some fishermen who had a bad season get supported. That's not the role of this. It's really trying to support stakeholders and fishermen that are hit by large-scale disasters. The more difficult question is, what is the payout? Traditionally, insurance pays an indemnity. So that's his, if you have a damage, the insurance makes you whole. However, there's lots of questions in red here. So how do you value the damage? Is it the loss of yield? How many tons of fish you catch? Is it the loss of revenue? Or is it the loss of profit? Because it might be that you know, there's factors that drive up your costs and drive you out of business. Um, how do you measure the loss in a particular bad season? Is it compared to your past years? Or is it based on how much you tried to fish or how much you have a permit for? Um, how do you determine what the loss is caused by? What if there are multiple factors? There's a disaster, but there's also you know, individual behavior that affects it. Do, you, do we increase observers or do you have to increase monitoring to determine that? What effects would this have on fisheries behavior? So there's a lot of issues and questions if you want to ensure an actual loss. A completely different type of insurance is parametric insurance. Now this is lesser known. It's not something that generally you know, individual people buy. Um, it's a type of insurance that's basically a, a financial contract. It's a very simple if-then statement. If a certain um, criteria is met that's independently measured, then a payout is unlocked. So it doesn't depend on your individual behavior. It depends on some third independent measure. So that could be rainfall, for example. So looking at crop insurance, this is one type of parametric insurance policy. It's an if-then statement. If rainfall in a specific location during a specific, specific time period falls below some threshold, then a farmer gets a payout. So in this example, if you're a, a cattle rancher in a specific county, and you know that your cows depend on grass in this region, and you know that if it's you know, a drought, you're gonna have to buy feed, then you can buy a simple insurance policy that says, hey, so how can we transfer this to fisheries? I'll skip this because you can see what the benefits are. We want to make a simple scheme where a fisherman can buy an index insurance depending on one region and the revenue that this region creates. And so the fisherman can buy into this insurance depending on how much exposure they have. If they or a large commercial operator that can buy larger policy, an individual captain or an individual fisherman can buy a policy for a smaller amount, they have to pay a premium accordingly and it could be subsidized. The payout is proportional. If a disaster hits and it's complete loss of revenue for that index, then they get the full payout. If the disaster only affects the revenue of this entire fishery by a smaller amount, they get a smaller payout. So you can think of an example where, in general, the entire index of this fishery 
produces $100 million per year. Fishermen fishing in this region buys an insurance policy for $20,000. If in a particular year, the revenue of the entire fishery drops below a certain predetermined trigger, they get a proportional payout. And so this gives two avenues for public policy to be enacted as well. You can, first of all, determine who's eligible to buy this insurance. And you should, what I think, do is prevent speculation, but allow people to get insurance for what they're exposed to generally. And second of all, the subsidy can be tailored based on need. It can be tailored based on public policy goals as well as fishery policy goals. The two major questions to think about here are how do we define these sectors, these parameters, and second of all, how do we measure these? The sectors is really a Goldilocks question. You want to make these just the right size, not too broad or they're not affected by a local disaster, also not too small because otherwise you have way too many different indexes and they're affected by individual participants. And so you want to measure commercial revenue. There's questions about how do you measure tribal revenue? How do you measure charter fishery revenue, state water, state fisheries, aquaculture? Questions to be, to be determined and researched, as well as who designs these. But if you can manage to create these indexes of just the right size, then you can create a viable insurance product. You also have to, of course, measure that, be able to measure that revenue in a timely manner so that after the close of the season, insurance gets paid out quickly. So we might have to come up with new ways to collect that data. And so to summarize what I see the role of insurance, it's really to ensure against seasonal events that hit a fishery. It's direct aid that reaches a fisherman in a fast manner and an individual need. It doesn't, it doesn't address trends due to climate change, due to habitat loss, for example. For that, the current process of appropriations and developing long-term projects that support in that entire community are still the most apt approach. But for helping individual fishermen, be that a commercial fisherman, be that a processing plant, be that a tribal community, an in index insurance scheme might be the best way to support them. And so with that, I'll stop and I'll take your questions and comments. Okay, does anyone in the room have a question? Thanks, Gualtiero. Um, this is not a terribly well-developed question, so feel free to take it whatever direction you want. Um, and your very, one of your last slides, you mentioned a difference between kind of fast turnaround seasonal events yep. and longer term things like climate change. Um, I, I was under the impression that the failure of the salmon runs in the Northeast, for example, was almost certainly due to climate change. So how would this sort of framework deal with those incidences like the salmon run failures that are getting more and more common, but are probably due to some of those longer term issues? That's a very well-formed question. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a good question because this idea that you can just split seasonal events from long-term trends is not true. Um, and there's, first of all, salmon events there certainly appears to be indications that yes, climate change affects them and makes them worse. In general, salmon run failures, there's a, a plethora of you know, influences that affect it, potentially aggravated by warming waters, by warming streams, by you know, overfishing in some cases, by habitat loss in some cases, more parasites in warmer waters. The way I see this being addressed by the insurance scheme versus long-term support is if one season there's a drastic decline, measured compared to the past average three years or five years, insurance pays out relative to that recent revenue. If there's a continuing loss the next year, insurance payouts decline because then the average moves. So you're basically using a moving average based on the previous years. Um, to really address the long-term loss and decline, insurance wouldn't solve that because there's a decreasing payout. You need long-term you know, projects or perhaps the fishery simply is not viable anymore. So what I see the insurance scheme is it's in some way agnostic to what causes it. It simply measures the revenue shortfall compared to the past three years 
currently it's five years sort of disaster assistance, and it pays out, you know, it measures the loss proportional to that. So same with the insurance scheme, it would measure your recent year revenue. If you have a strong decline compared to that, you got to pay out. But if there's year after year of decline, then the insurance payout decreases as well. And of course, you would need to consider other ways to support a community. So you mentioned adverse selection in the fisheries. Um, so are you envisioning this, and I realize it's all hypothetical at this point, but are you envisioning this as the fishermen just going out and shopping for insurance plans or a mandatory nope, insurance? No, absolutely optional. Okay. Um, because it doesn't depend on who participates. What the fishery measures is the index of everybody fishing in a specific region, be that the Northern California crab fishery. If you have some way to measure that entire fishery revenue, that's independent of who participates in the insurance. Anybody can go buy insurance and choose what amount they want to be insured for. A processing plant that needs $100,000 coverage in case the fishery shut would have to pay 100 times more than a fisherman who buys a $1,000 coverage. And so it's not mandatory and the insurance scheme works even if there's few participants. Um, in general, I think we haven't gone into underwriting, but the federal government I think has some role in being involved in underwriting this and especially with subsidies addressing the affordability question this wouldn't work if premiums are too high um, but in terms of adverse selection even if only the riskiest participants buy it that doesn't affect the total revenue of a fishery I know that you didn't talk about the underwriting aspect of this, but as far as, do you see this as being something where current insurance companies make this a part of it and there's some sort of like incentivization for them to do that from the federal government or like what, yeah. what's your kind of idea for that? Um, what I've looked at is crop insurance. It's uh, kind of worms once you open it. <laughs> and it's a complicated way too, but simply put, in crop insurance world, the federal government, to a large extent, reinsures and provides the bulk of the underwriting. Federal uh, private insurance providers that are approved provide the the face-to-face -face contact, the brokerage. They do take on some partial risk sharing. However, the federal government kind of is the the, the insurer of last resort, and it's heavily subsidized. In general, premiums are subsidized on average by sixty percent. Um, I see potentially a similar type of solution viable for fisheries, perhaps even a way to make this, you know, expand the, the mandate of the current, you know, structure to include fisheries. Um, I've looked into it, would it be possible to just, you know, directly subsidize or incentivize private companies to provide this? Um, it gets trickier, I think, because the expertise in really determining, you know, the, the fishery ecology, the fishery economics is in NOAA and the government. And I think that's a role that can't just be outsourced. Um, and you also want to be, you know, cognizant of where does your underwriting and federal money go towards? Does it just go towards private insurance operation costs or does it go to actual fishery stakeholders? It almost seems like ideally because it's sort of a one-off event, if there is a way like FEMA is well set up for dealing with some of those things. On different yeah. Like yeah. Sense. Okay, great. And we did have, it looks like one online question. So I think we have a little bit of time for that. Um, okay. Uh, so what might be considered an event today that exceeds a threshold of loss compared to the past three to five years that could become more common with climate change, blurring the lines of what is an event versus long-term decline due to climate change. How can this be accounted for? And is access to an insurance scheme a disincentive for adaptation? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, if you consider, for example, the flooding events that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, um, Potentially, if you look at some you know, climate models and rainfall predictions, it could be that those become more 
frequent. Um, again, going back to the question of trend versus event, and do you disincentivize long-term, you know, addressing the issues? I don't see insurance replacing the long-term issues. It's a way to to soften the blow of a, an event. It does not in any way take away the, the need to really address underlying causes. Um, in case of you know large-scale events like historic rainfall affecting a flooding event, um, there's not that much the local fishery management council, for example, could do or local fishermen. They depend on much larger action. Um, this is a way to support the fishermen and the businesses who are affected by that. And I think this is a way to, to provide that help in an expedient manner without taking away the, the mandate in general of policy and government to think about long-term trends. All right, thank you. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. So um, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Galtiero. Thank you.